I don't get excited a lot about politicos in Washington, D.C. I had the fun privilege of lecturing a U.S. senator yesterday. And he was like, well, he, he goes, who are you? And I said, Kristen. He goes, what do you do? I said, oh, I lead this group called Students for Life. You know, we work with young people. Well, how's it going with the youngsters? And I said, <laughs> I said it's going pretty good. We're kind of the pro-life generation. You'll see 500,000 of them here in the streets today, Senator. Uh, it's great to meet you, too. But before our next speaker comes out, I want to introduce our introducer. Last year, has anyone here, was here last year? You survived Snow Mageddon and Ice Mageddon. We had given an award to the Knights of Columbus for all their awesome work with ultrasounds, getting life-saving ultrasound technologies in pregnancy resource centers, and they weren't able to come to accept their award. So I invited the Vice President of the Knights of Columbus to come today to introduce our next speaker. So you have a special treat. So Andrew Walther is going to be coming up here in a second. For the past 10 years, Andrew has worked for the Knights of Columbus in New Haven, Connecticut, as Vice President for Communications and Strategic Planning. He oversees uh, the organization's communications, media relations, book publishing, polling. Basically anything that comes out of Knights of Columbus, this guy has seen it. Um, he is super active. Uh, he has worked to organize museum exhibits and conferences in North America and Europe. Has been the executive producer uh, for a number of documentaries on Pope Francis, St. John Paul II. Relief efforts in Haiti. I'm like, where are the Catholics? Why aren't they cheering? <laughs> Should I tweet Pope Francis and be like, oh, he didn't get any applause? No, I'm joking. Uh, he also served as principal organizer of the 2001 Love and Life Site, the English Language Center of the World Youth Day in Madrid. Uh, prior to coming to Knights, he was a freelance journalist and actually taught at University of Southern California. Uh, he currently is the chairman of the board of the National Office for Post-Abortion Reconciliation and Healing. He's helped organize a number of events on the effects of abortion on parents, uh, including conferences in Chicago and San Francisco. I bet ours are cooler. In 2000, he co-founded the annual conference that's now the Cardinal uh, John O'Connor Conference at Georgetown every year. And he actually served on the board of ACL, American Collegiate for Life, which is the predecessor organization of Students for Life. So, uh, without further ado, Andrew Walther. Thank you very much, Kristen. And thank you for the opportunity also to say a few words and to introduce Professor George. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here with you. I remember about 15 years ago coming to my first Students for Life event, and I think there are somewhere between 10 and 20 times as many of you here today as there were then. No, it's really a testament to the hard work of Kristen and her team and indicative of the fact that on abortion, we're winning the hearts and minds of the American people of every age. It doesn't mean we don't face challenges, like attempts to coerce employers to provide abortifacient drugs. It doesn't mean that there won't be assisted suicide legislation all over the country this year. But when you look around this room or you look around the March for Life and you see the demographic makeup of the crowd, you look at the age demographics around you, it's very, very clear that the momentum is in our direction. And in case anybody worries that that's just anecdotal, it's not. We released our polling a couple of days ago. We do polling every year on abortion at this time of year. And it dispels this myth out there that millennials somehow support abortion. In fact, young people think abortion is immoral at a rate of about 6 in 10, just like the American public generally. And they want significant restrictions on abortion at a rate of 8 in 10, which again tracks with the American public generally. Now, one, one other thing here before I introduce Professor George, and that's this. Don't settle for anyone telling you that you're the future of the pro-life movement in the United States. You're already an important part of the pro-life movement, 
and you're the part of the movement with the longest future ahead of you. And your attendance at this conference is really a great step in helping you to take decisive action in your own life. And the reason is simple. Because working together, we can build a network for life, we can change this country and create a culture of life, and second, because at this conference, it gives you the tools you need to really create that culture of life as you learn from some of the most effective and intelligent people in the pro-life community. And speaking of intelligent and effective people, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Professor Robert George, who's the recipient of Students for Life's Defender of Life Award. Professor Robert P. George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions in Princeton University. He also regularly teaches at Harvard Law School as a visiting professor. He served as the Chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and is currently Vice Chairman. He previously served on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a Presidential Appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He's also served on UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Society and Technology and is a former Judicial Fellow at the U.S. Supreme Court where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. Professor George is also the author of several books including Embryo, A Defense of Human Life and Conscience and Its Enemies and he has countless articles and essays published in major newspapers, magazines, law reviews and academic journals. A graduate of Swarthmore College and Harvard Law School, Professor George also earned a master's degree in theology from Harvard and a doctorate in philosophy of law from Oxford University. He was elected to Phi Beta Kappa at Swarthmore and received a Knox Fellowship from Harvard for graduate study in law and uh, from Harvard and study of law and philosophy at Oxford. He holds honorary doctorates of law, letters, ethics, science, divinity, humane letters, civil law, and juridical science. And among his many awards are the United States Presidential Citizens Medal, the Honorific Medal for the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland, the Bradley Prize for Intellectual and Civic Achievement, the Philip Merrill Award for the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, the Paul Bader Award for the Federalist Society, a Silver Gavel Award of the American Bar Association, and many more. Without further ado, Professor Robert George. Fellow warriors in the greatest cause of all. On the night before he died, Reverend Martin Luther King, the great leader of the preeminent human rights struggle of his time, reflected on the achievements of his movement, looking out at the landscape in light of the great struggle that had been conducted at great cost with many sacrifices to undo the terrible system of oppression represented by segregation and Jim Crow laws under which the descendants of slaves labored. And on that evening, surveying that landscape, he said, I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. I might not get there with you, but I know that we as a people will get to the promised land. You see, Dr. King, surveying that landscape, could see that the victory had already been won. The victory in the realm of ideas had already been won. Hearts had already been turned. The system of segregation in Jim Crow had already been discredited. 
I have to tell you that today as I speak with you, I feel in my own way that I am now at the mountaintop. I've been to the mountaintop because I survey the landscape of the struggle that we have waged from long before almost any of you were born. I look back at a time when we were told by the powerful, by the elite, by the influential, that the pro-life movement had no hope. And then I see thousands of young people like yourselves, dedicated, bold, brilliant, fearless, here in this church auditorium or in front of the mall or the Congress of the Supreme Court yesterday. And I realize that there's a fundamental sense in which the battle has been won. No, we have not yet gotten to the promised land. We have not yet overturned Roe against Wade. We have not yet put into place legislation that would protect every child from the earliest embryonic stage until death. No, we haven't achieved those things. And yet, we have won the argument. I see that we've won the argument when I look out from the mountaintop and I see the organization that was once known as the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, which then changed its name to the National Association for Abortion Rights, now changing its name to NARAL Pro-Choice America, or simply NARAL. Do you notice the missing word? The word they don't want to say? The reality they don't want to face up with? The word abortion is gone, erased. Abortion was once a great cause for them. They were proud of the word. They stood for the right to abortion. And now they have to hide it. Why? Because, as Andrew pointed out, the public is not with them, not on the argument. Yes, there still remains ambivalence about certain hard cases, but on the fundamental question, of whether abortion is good or bad, liberation or killing, the argument has been won. Contributing to that victory clearly has been technology, a technology that is run of the mill to you. You've never known a time with, without it, but one that was revolutionary for those of us of a certain age. Sonography brought home to the American people and to people throughout the world the reality of the life, the human life, the beautiful human life of the child in the womb. And so I visit the homes of my colleagues. Perhaps my wife and I are invited to dinner or some event at a colleague's home. And I still live in a part of the world that hasn't completely gotten the message. I teach at a university. So my academic colleagues still hanging on to that old-time religion of abortion rights. I'll walk into the home, often through the kitchen entry. I'll drop my bottle of wine or my box of chocolates as a house gift, and then I'll glance over at the refrigerator. And there on the refrigerator, I see a photograph. And the photograph is of a little boy or a little girl, perhaps sucking its thumb. And I'll say to my colleague, who is that? And my colleague might say, oh, that's little Sally, our granddaughter, or little Billy, our son. Oh, Sally or Billy. Uh, how old? Oh, no, no, that's in the womb. Oh, it's a sonographic image. How wonderful. Congratulations. What a blessing for you. Now you see they know, however much they hang on to the idea that abortion is a right or that there's nothing wrong with it. 
or there's no injustice, or there's no injury, or there's no killing going on. They know because the technology makes it impossible not to know that that little child in the womb, whether wanted or unwanted, is a precious human being, a member of the human family. You cannot sustain an argument for abortion over the long term with that reality staring you in the face. What psychologists call cognitive dissonance is going to get you. You can hang on. You can try your best in the grip of ideology to live with that contradiction. This is little Sally. This is little Billy. But abortion is fine. But eventually, you have to resolve that one. And the reality is what it is, as was famously said. Facts are stubborn things. But it's not just the technology, my young friends. It's the fact that the pro-life movement from the early 1970s forward refused to yield, refused to give up, refused to abandon the child in the womb to the injustice of abortion. I remember it so well, like it was yesterday. I was younger than any of you are, I believe. 13 years old when my mother recruited me into the pro-life movement by starting to take me to meetings of the pro-life club at the Newman Center, the Catholic chaplaincy of West Virginia University in the town of Morgantown, where I grew up. The movement to liberalize abortion laws had already begun. Roe versus Wade hadn't yet been handed down, but there was pressure building in a certain sector of society in the wake of the sexual revolution to do away with the old protections of the unborn, with the old laws prohibiting or restricting abortion. My mother was very early in the movement and brought me in and I remember even as a 13-year-old child, as an adolescent, just being shocked by the very idea of abortion. You see, I was the first of five children, all boys, kind of basketball team, a Huck Finn existence growing up in West Virginia in the hills. But I could remember my mom's pregnancy with the three youngest boys. And, you know, I hadn't yet studied any biology, much less any specialized biology like embryology or human developmental biology. But even at 13 and even in 1968 or 69, I knew that what was inside mom's body wasn't a potato or an alligator. <laughs> that was a little baby. Now in those days we couldn't tell which sex it was. But that was the little fellow who turned out to be my brother Kent, and then the little fellow who turned out to be my brother Keith, and then the little fellow who turned out to be my brother Eddie. I was in no doubt, and I was shocked by the thought that anyone would want to kill a baby in the womb, and even more shocked by the thought that the law would permit such a thing. So I was an easy recruit into the pro-life movement. I thought little ones like my little brothers needed to be protected. And yet, within a few years, by 1973, when Roe against Wade was handed down, the elite culture had embraced abortion, had embraced the abortion license. The sophisticated people, the educated people, the right-thinking people thought of abortion as liberation for women, as the ticket to women's equality, as modern, as with it, is enabling society to move forward and kind of making sure that not too many undesirable people were born. They didn't say that one too loudly, but it was there, that eugenic mentality, even in 71 and 72 and 73. And with the elite, the influential, the wealthy, the powerful, highly educated, embracing abortion, we were told that 
It's time for you, backward, indeed backwoods, pro-life so-called people to get out of the way. You're on the wrong side of history. Have you heard that one today? Today it's uttered in a different connection. Back then, it was with regard to abortion. If you were pro-life, you were told, you're on the wrong side of history. Americans are ready for abortion. Americans are going to embrace it. In fact, the only people holding out against it are a few elderly priests, and soon they'll die out. And with all the young people being for abortion, abortion will be integrated pretty much effortlessly into American life, and it will disappear as an issue. Indeed, young friends, on January 23rd, 1973, the New York Times, reporting on the decision of the day before in Roe versus Wade, reported that the Supreme Court of the United States yesterday settled the issue of abortion. And yet, here we are, 40-something years later, in 2015, and abortion is the most unsettled issue in American politics. A majority of Americans, including a majority of young Americans, oppose it, understand that it is immoral and unjust. So what happened? Why didn't the prediction come true? Why didn't the pro-life movement fade away when a few elderly priests died? It's because pro-life stalwarts refused to give up. They kept faith. When people called them names, when they hurled abuse at them, when they subjected them to discrimination, for example, in hiring for academic positions, people refused to be intimidated into acquiescence or even silence. They insisted on remaining faithful, standing up, speaking out for the defenseless child in the womb. So today when I accept with great pleasure, and I feel deeply honored, this award from you, from Students for Life, I, an old guy, accept it on behalf of my generation and my mother's generation, who through the hardest of hard times and in the worst circumstances refused to yield, remained faithful, spoke out, would not be tamed in defense of the unborn child. And it gives me enormous joy to see you gathered here in this great cause. And that's why I feel as though I've been to the mountaintop. I'm standing on the mountaintop. I see the future and you are it. When I walked in here today, I saw all these marvelous t-shirts with various slogans on them. And one slogan especially arrested me. One of you out there, at least maybe more, are wearing it. I saw a young man wearing it. And the t-shirt said, I survived Roe versus Wade, but Roe versus Wade will not survive me. Are you wearing, the, whoever's wearing that t-shirt, will you stand up, whoever's wearing, is, it, is he here, whoever's wearing that t-shirt? There he is, I survived Roe versus Wade, it won't survive me. Now I have a request for you, because I am no Martin Luther King. I don't have nearly his charisma or his record of sacrifice. And I'm not nearly as selfless as he was. And that's why I'm going to make this request to you. Your t-shirt says, I survived Roe versus Wade, but it will not survive me. And I know you mean that, and I know you will accomplish that. But because I'm not selfless, 
I'm not satisfied simply to stand on the mountaintop and see that promised land where every child is protected in law and welcomed in life. I want to get to that promised land. So I'm asking you young people to make it the case not only that Roe versus Wade doesn't survive you, but speed up the clock so Roe versus Wade doesn't survive me. Thank you, my young friends. God bless you, every single one. Thank you.